This is a look at the local history of Glenshiel and Kintail. Here we see the famous Five Sisters of Kintail from Shiel Bridge, and the hills are the three and a half thousand foot high Skururin and Skurna Karna. We will start with an explanation of my relationship to the area. Kintail was one of the playgrounds of my youth. We did a lot of hill walking here in the 1960s and early 1970s. Here we are, camped in Glen Shiel in 1967. Little did I know then that in five years' time I would have a family connection to the last family living in the Glen. Kintail is a very mountainous part of Scotland. There are 20 thin rows on the ridges bounding the north side and south sides of Glen Shiel. In 1988, Jim Broxap established a new record by climbing 28 Munros in a day, which included all of the ones shown on this map, plus a few on the north side of Glen Affric, in a 78-mile round trip from Clooney Inn. Strange as it may seem, my continued association with Glen Shiel was thereafter brought about by my cousin Glenys from the South Island of New Zealand, whose story is a fine tale of how chance can totally change your whole life. On the left, I am the blue box, and above me, the red box is my grandfather. The middle red box is my grandfather's brother, Thomas Clark Archibald, who emigrated to New Zealand in 1915. The two yellow boxes below him are his granddaughters, Janice and Glenys, born and brought up in the South Island of New Zealand, and in 1970 they came back to Scotland on a six-month working holiday, the first meeting between the two branches of the family for 55 years. So Glenys and Janice came to visit my family in Aberdeen, and this is a still taken from an 8mm cine film which shows my mother and my wife on the left, with Glenys and Janice on the right. The green box on the right is Peggy McRae, who was the daughter of my grandfather's sister. When Glenys and Janice then went to visit Peggy McRae in Edinburgh, the McRae's were just leaving to go on holiday to Kintail for two months, and Glenys went with them. While working in the local hotel in Kintail, cousin Glenys met Dolan Macmillan, who, with his uncle Johnny Ross, shepherded the five sisters of Kintail, and married him in 1972. So that is how a good-looking young bird from the South Island of New Zealand landed up marrying the man who shepherds the five sisters of Kintail. So started my long-term association with Glenshiel, which has been going on now for 50 years. Glenys and Dolan settled down in Kintail and raised four children with Dolan carrying on the sheep farm when his uncle Johnny Ross retired. They have nine grandchildren and their youngest son is now running the family farm at Achnagart. Dolan had an interesting family tree. His parents had both died by the time he was eight years old and his uncle John Ross took on Dolan and his three siblings and kept them together as a family and brought them up on the farm at Achnagart. His grandfather Tom Ross, with his medals, returned from the Boer War and came to Achnagart as an assistant gamekeeper and married the gamekeeper's daughter Sarah. His great-grandfather was Hugh McLean, the gamekeeper at Achnagart, who had married Christina Ross. His great-great-grandfather was John Ross, who, with his family, were some of the 90 victims of the forced clearance of Glen Calby in Easter Ross in 1845. John Ross was one of those who famously scratched their names on the window at Croyck Church. While sheltering in Croyck Churchyard, the woman milked a cow in a nearby field to feed the infants, and to put the milk in a flask borrowed from the church. Later, the church was locked, and they were unable to return the flask, which remained in Dolan's family until 2015, 
when he gifted it to the museum in Inverness. Dolan was a member of Kintail Mountain Rescue for 30 years, most of them as leader of the team. In 1997, Dolan was awarded an MBE for services to the community. The Macmillan family of Achnagart in 2012. Dolan is the tall figure in the grey jacket just left of centre, and Glenis is to his right behind the boy in the blue sweatshirt. Everybody else to Dolan's right are their children and grandchildren. There are various other relations to the left of Dolan. So that is Glenys' story, none of which would have happened if the McCrae's had not been about to leave for Kintail when Glenys went to visit them. So let us have a look at the history of the area, which involved the Clan MacDonald, the Clan Mackenzie and the Clan McCrae. We will also consider the system of land tenure and the prosperity of the people. The territory controlled by the Macdonalds, Lords of the Isles, is marked in blue and grey on the map. The west coast of Scotland was an area controlled by the Lords of the Isles before the 15th century, a powerful private fiefdom who operated independently of the Scottish Crown. Our particular interest is the grey area on the map, which is the earldom of Ross. On this map, the earldom of Ross is the brown area with Mackenzie written all over it, and the parish of Glenshiel is outlined in red. The Mackenzies held the land under a charter granted to them by the Macdonalds and not from the Scottish Crown. So, under the feudal system, the Mackenzies were the Macdonald's vassals. In the 15th century, the ownership of the earldom of Ross was hotly disputed by the House of Stuart, and one of the early battles in this squabble was at Harlow near Inverurie in 1411. James III forfeited the earldom of Ross from the Macdonald's in 1475, but he was too weak to take control of the area. The Mackenzies changed their allegiance to the House of Stuart, defeating their erstwhile allies the Macdonalds in battle in 1480, resulting in crown domination of the area and a great increase in their own power. The Clan Macrae had earned a reputation as fighting men for Lord Lovett, and they came to contail as sword servants to the Mackenzies in exchange for land. It is said that Macrae of Contail had a genealogy of his ancient family written out on a long narrow scroll, near the middle of which there occurred a marginal note which read, About this time the world was created. The Macraes became constables of Aelandonan Castle, in a census in 1793, all the inhabitants of Contail were Macrae's, with the exception of two or three families. The Mackenzies supported the Jacobites in the 1715 uprising, and their sword servants, the Macrae's, were wiped out almost to a man at the Battle of Sheriff Muir. This is a monument to the Macrae's at the site of the battle. The Mackenzies also supported the Jacobite cause in the Spanish-backed 1719 uprising, as a result of which their lands were forfeited by the Crown and the Earl of Seaforth had to flee to France. The presence of 300 Spanish troops makes this the last battle fought in British soil between a foreign army and the British army. This is the man who fled to France, William Mackenzie, the 5th Earl of Seaforth. Seaforth was pardoned in 1726 and his sons bought back their lands. However, the Mackenzies had learned their lesson and did not join the Jacobites in the 1745 uprising. Prior to 1743, the Highlanders grew oats and had cattle for milk and butter and hens for eggs. It was subsistence agriculture living permanently on the edge of starvation. In 1743, potatoes were introduced to the Highlands, which considerably eased the shortage of food.
In 1791, at the time of the old statistical account of Scotland, the parish of Kintail seems to have been reasonably prosperous, with 1,200 head of cattle and 300 horses in the area. This is Roy's military map of 1755, showing the bottom six miles of Glen Shiel. The Clachans are marked in red. In 1792, of the 17 farms in Glenshiel, all except two were occupied by multiple tenants, so that each farm formed a village, or Clachan. Each tenant's right to keep stock and his share of the arable ground was proportional to his share of the rent. This was a system of land tenure universally used throughout rural Scotland until the arrival of agricultural reform in the 1800s. Individual people could not afford to rent land, so a group joined together to rent a small area which they worked communally. Each clapping would have been a family group and they shared the work of growing crops and tending beasts. Because they were a family group, they also shared their food. The last Earl of Seaforth had stated that he preferred people to sheep and promised that there would be no evictions for sheep. However, when he died in 1814, the people no longer had a protector and the inevitable clearance of the people out of the glens took place. With the sheep came an increase of rents of up to 6,000% in a generation. Those cotters that remained became paupers crowded on the coast. It is unclear how they made a living, as the west coast herring fishing had fallen off at this time. Some will have collected shellfish along the coast, while others will have been involved in the illicit distillation of whisky. The 1845 statistical account of Scotland documents the growing poverty in the area. Between 1820 and 1880, two-thirds of the Highland estates changed hands, including Kintail, which was split up and sold off to nine different proprietors in 1840. The Glensheel estate was bought by Sir Alexander Matheson in 1840. Like many of the new landowners in the Highlands, Sir Alexander had earned his fortune from the opium trade in the Far East and he used his money to build Dunkraig Castle as his home on the shores of Loch Carron. Increasingly, estate ownership landed up in lowland, English or even American hands, forming a new disassociated elite in a region of traditional family allegiance. Winans was the most extreme example of the invading force of this new disassociated elite. He was an American businessman who acquired ownership or tenancy of over 250,000 acres in Glenstrathfarer, Glencanish and Glenafric in the highlands of Scotland. In 1884, he prosecuted a Scotsman, Murdoch Macrae of Carngorm, for grazing a pet lamb on land owned by him at Morvich. The failure of Winnan's prosecution helped to establish the right to roam, which was a key element in opening up the countryside to the public. His favoured hunting tactic was to organise teams of gillies to drive deer into narrow passes where they would be mown down with modern firearms. An undignified corruption of the medieval Tinshelf. It was a social revolution and the introduction of sheep destroyed the people's traditional way of life. So by 1847 the population of the parish of Glenshiel was 750 of whom only 150 were self-sustaining, with the remaining 600 being destitute and dependent on handouts from the church and the landowner to avoid starvation. In 1841 census, of the 13 households along both sides of the river, six were headed by shepherds. By 1846, the agriculture of the highlands had become a monoculture based on potatoes. So when potato blight arrived that year, it caused a famine which lasted for 10 years, heaping even more misery onto the people. By 1860, public opinion was entirely hostile to evictions to make way for sheep. Between 1870 and 1900, the sheep were cleared from the land 
and the whole area was turned into a vast sporting estate for hunting, shooting and fishing. After the Napier Commission in 1883, it seemed that pressure was put on the cotters to leave and the population of Kintail declined by 500 in the space of 10 years. Shield Lodge, formerly a very comfortable hotel, was converted into a shooting lodge in 1907. In 1917, during World War I, sheep were reintroduced to the Glen under the Defence of the Realm Act to help feed the nation. The National Trust for Scotland bought the Kintail Estate in 1945. These are the boundaries of the modern shooting estates. The management of deer numbers continues to be a controversial issue and the National Trust for Scotland who initially had a no-kill policy, were eventually forced to change their management strategy because of marauding herds of scraggy deer. The yellow table shows the current number of red deer in the Kintail area, which, at the latest count, numbered 4,878 deer. When you look at the blue table and realise that every one of the hundreds of sporting estates in Scotland were doing exactly the same thing, you realise it is a miracle that any of these birds and animals survived the slaughter. Let us have a look at the history of travel in this remote area and the development of roads. The red road through the map is the modern main road to Skye from the Lake Grain through Glenmoriston and Glenshiel which follows the line of the military road built in 1755. However, before the military road was built, most travellers to and from Inverness took the route through Glenleicht and Glenafric, which was only suitable for foot traffic and horses. This route took you to the east coast at Bewley, about 11 miles west of Inverness. There have been four roads developed through Glenshiel over the last 274 years, and few people managed to identify them correctly, including the Ordnance Survey, who, in their map of 1845, refer to General Wade's military road, a term which is loosely used to refer to all military roads built in the 1700s. Also, General Wade was actually a field marshal, so along with the fact that he did not build the road, that is two errors in one notation on the map. Starting in 1724, Field Marshal Wade built the red roads in this map, a road on the line of what is now the A9 from Dunkel to Inverness, a road through the Coriaric Pass from Laganbridge and Speyside to Fort Augustus, and a road down the Great Glen from Inverness to Fort William, before handing over to General Clayton in 1733, and the same year responsibility was again passed on to Major William Caulfield. Prior to assuming command of the road building programme, Caulfield had worked under Wade and the construction of some of the roads attributed to Wade, such as the road down the east side of Loch Ness, was supervised by Caulfield as the road surveyor. In total, 250 miles of roads are attributed to Wade and 800 miles to Caulfield. These roads remained the responsibility of the army until 1814 when their management was passed on to the Commissioners of Highland Roads and Bridges. The road we are interested in is the one from Fort Augustus to Bernara Barracks and Glenelg, which ran up Glen Morriston, down Glenshiel and over Mamratigan to reach the barracks at Glenelg. This is the only through road in a vast mountainous tract of Scotland, 66 miles high and 50 miles wide which is about the same size as Aberdeenshire. The road through Glenshiel, shown on the map, was built by Major William Caulfield and is referred to as the Old Military Road and was built in the years just before 1755. The map shows the bottom six miles of Glenshiel, where the road meets the west coast of Scotland. The Old Military Road crossed to the north side of the River Shiel near the bottom of the map and crossed back again near the mouth of the river. The orange line is the realignment of the Caulfields military road done in 1771, which removes the two crossings of the River Shiel 
as the road stays on the south side of the river. We know that because the military marker stones shown in the map are well documented and show the date 1771. These are the two military marker stones shown in the previous map. They were fortunately photographed before they were lost. It is pretty certain that at least for 15 years, from 1770 to 1784, a regimental party from Fort Augustus was employed each year upon this road, and as the regiments in Fort Augustus were changed annually, each different regiment recorded their work on a marker stone at the roadside for all to see. Stone number one bears the inscription, 24 Regiment Ended. Stone number two says, the 4th of the King's Royal Regiment made 249 yards of Road East, 1771. This map shows Thomas Telford's 1815 Road to the Isles in red, which mainly followed the 1771 realignment of the old military road. The modern two-lane road, built in 1967, follows the line of Telford's Road. So there we have the four roads the 1755 Old Military Road, the 1771 Realignment, Telford's 1815 Road and the modern two-lane road built in 1967. This is what remains of the original Old Military Road on the north side of the Glen. A well-preserved section of the Old Military Road near Melgar in the Corriaric Pass. This is what the road would have looked like when it was first built. Can you imagine doing a 20-mile march on that surface? Telford's 1815 road, winding through the Truff of Glenshiel. The hills in the background are Fahig and the Saddle. Another photograph of Telford's 1815 road, winding through Glenshiel. The hills in the background are the ridge of the Five Sisters of Kintail. This is Telford's 1815 road, crossing the River Shiel at Aisne and Aram, about seven miles from Shiel Bridge. Telford's bridge at Aisne and Aram being replaced by a new bridge when the modern double-track road was built through the glen in 1967. So let us take a trip up Glenshiel. Most of the places that we will see are marked on this map. Little remains of the old clachans that the people lived in prior to 1800 and most of the houses are shepherds' houses built in the early 1800s which were subsequently occupied by gamekeepers when the sheep were moved from the glen. The various houses in the glen are a Huron, Terloishi, Achna Shiel, an old Clachan, Achna Gart, Maligan, Lupa Njorn, Lupa Votich, Cluany Inn, an inn later to become a hotel, Cluany Lodge, which was a hunting lodge, Corrie Lair Lodge, a hunting lodge, and Lundy Cottage. We start off at the head of Loch Duich in Shiel Village. The Red Road is Telford's 1815 road to the Isles. Invershiel is where the Kintail Lodge Hotel is now situated. In the village, we see the main dwellings are the manse, Sheel House, and Sheel Inn. We see the two different sites for the post office, at the bridge, and at the inn. We also see Maggie Ormistus Cottage, the old public school, and the old Catholic chapel. The three prominent buildings are Shiel Lodge, Shiel House and the Manse. The road running through the picture is Telford's 1815 road to Skye and we can see his bridge across the River Shiel just below the Manse. The road to Glenelg over Mamratigan is seen climbing the hill on the far side of the loch on the left. The river coming in from the left on this side of Shiel Lodge is the Althulan, which drains the west flank of the saddle. The house at the north end of the bridge, directly below the manse, was occupied by Peggy McCree, who was single and lived there all her life. The small building to the right of it is the post office. 
Note Maggie Ormiston's cottage, the small white triangle in the field in front of Shield Lodge. This is Maggie Ormiston's cottage, and in 1901 she was living here with her younger sister Isabella, who was known as Belle. At that time, Maggie was 62 years old and a laundry maid working at home, and her sister was a pauper. Remember Sister Belle, we will see her again later. Shield Lodge was originally a staging post on the through route from the Great Glen to Skye. On the 1845 Ordnance Survey map, Shield Lodge is marked as an inn and post office. It developed into a very comfortable hotel until it was converted into a shooting lodge in 1907. Shield Lodge is now a holiday cottage that sleeps 16 people. Shield House was originally an inn on the Rattigan Estate. But after the Rattigan estate was split up and sold off, this area became part of the Sheil estate. After it closed as an inn, it became a private dwelling, owned by a Macrae from Paisley, and the house was known by the locals as Paisley. He was a wealthy man, and had plans to develop the walled fish trap at the head of Loch Duich and build a fish canning factory. His various exploits annoyed the locals, who eventually managed to overturn his lovely horse and carriage up the Shield Road, which sickened him and he left. The field between Shield House and the bridge was known as the Irish Field, as ballast from the boats landing goods such as coal was dumped here. The Kintail Post Office was marked in the 1900 map as being at the north end of Telford's Bridge over the River Shield. Edwardian tourists at the Glen Shield Post Office in July 1913. The sign says, Post Office for Money Orders, Savings Bank, Parcel Post, Telegraph, Insurance and Annuity Business. This seems to be the post office marked in the 1845 map beside the Shield Lodge. The bridge over the Alt Ulan in Shield Village. The experts cannot decide whether this bridge was built as part of the 1771 realignment of the old military road or as part of Thomas Telford's Road to the Isles, built in 1815. Also note the incorrect caption on the postcard. When the Ordnance Survey don't know who built the road, we can hardly blame the postcard manufacturers for also getting it wrong. Feral goats roam the Five Sisters and the surrounding area. The Glenshiel harvest in 1886 and everyone is lending a hand, even the cook from the Shiel Inn, who is sixth from the left. Seventh from the right is Belle Ormiston the pauper, whom we have previously met. The scene demonstrates very well the communal spirit that existed in the people of the Highlands in the olden days when everybody pitched in to help with the big jobs. Shield Bridge, built by Thomas Telford in 1820. This year is its bicentennial. As we leave Shield Village, the last buildings are the old school and Catholic chapel in the bottom left corner. The Shield shop, built in the 1950s, is in the centre. The plattish area, which we can see across the river, was called the Pain, and in the old days that area was used by the crofters for grazing their livestock and for arable farming. The name Pain may be derived from the Gaelic word for a penny, which is Pain, which may have been the original rental value of the land. This photo was taken before 1967, when the modern two-lane road was built. The new road ran down the far side of the fence at the filling station, across the river and then down the Payne to join Telford's Road at the north end of the bridge over the River Shield. Another view of the Shield shop, also dating from the 1960s. This is Old Shield School. In the 1940s, my cousin's husband Dolan walked to three miles from his home at Achnagark to the school every day in his bare feet. 
We cannot imagine doing that. But Dolan also said that on the farm, if you were sent to take in the cows for milking, if the cow had been lying down and got up, you went and stood for the cow had been because it was warm on the feet. The Old Catholic Chapel in Sheol Village Soon after leaving the village, we come to Loch Sheel, which every year has swans and ducks on it, and is a stop-off place for salmon and sea trout going up the river, and the fishing above the loch was always very good. The wood beyond the loch was called the Coogan Wood, and is where the ghost dog lived and terrified everybody, and kept them on the straight and narrow. It was known as the Coo Do, the black dog, but Dolan never saw it. One story says that the fairies took a dislike to the dog and enticed it into their place of residence. When it emerged, it was completely bald, so it was no longer the coup do. In the late 1800s, the cows were summered up on the plats above Loch Shiel, and there was a little wall to stop them coming back down again. The girls milked the cows here in the evening, as there was a place to wash the buckets. A family story passed down to Dolan from his uncle Johnny Ross concerned the Boa family, who came to Glenshiel with the sheep. One of them fancied one of the Macrae girls who milked the cows at Loch Shiel. He was a shepherd, and in the evening he used to sit on the wall and wait for her to come up to milk the cows so that he could talk to her. While waiting, he started to carve his name, B-O-A, on a big stone there, but he had only carved B-O before the pair of them ran off together. The north side of Glenshiel is bounded by the ridge of the five sisters of Kintail. Skurnamorich, the one that runs to the sea. Skurnasai, the fair or yellow one, or the peak of the arrows. Skururan, because of the wells that are on it. Skurnakarnach, cairns and rocks. Skurnakishchadu, Hill of the Black Chest. On the south side of the river, we have the Donald Campbell Memorial, the two military marker stones, the Souterrain and Turloishi. In the heyday of sheep farming in the Glen, Turloishi was one of the main holding places for sheep and had pens capable of holding more than a thousand sheep. Some of the cornerstones for the walls of the pens are still visible today. Just to the right of Turloishi, is Achna Shelach, where the Spanish and Highlanders camped at the start of their march eastward in the 1719 uprising. On the north side of the river, we have Clach of Asti, the Broch and Ochuron, which had good grazing land, which was converted into crops at a later time, to increase the amount of arable land available to the crofters. On the right, we have the Glass Carn and Croc Coopan. Donald Campbell was gassed in World War I, but survived and ran the inn at Clooney for a while before moving down to Shiel village. When he died, the service was held in the Catholic chapel at Shiel, and the coffin was walked up to the road to here, from where it was transported back to his native Bewley. His brother John was killed at the song, and it is thought that his name was also supposed to be on the stone, but for some reason it never happened. The Souterrain at Culsh, Aberdeenshire, which is very similar to the one which was destroyed by the road building at Turlaishi. The Ponyburn, where the first military marker stone got buried by forestry roadworks. The house at Turlaishi was originally built for a shepherd. Later it was used to house workers at the Afnagart quarry. When the quarry closed, it was allowed to fall into ruin. Recently, it has been refurbished, but nobody now lives in it permanently. This is Clash of Vasti, or the Christening Stone. There was diphtheria in six or seven houses in the Clooney area, 12 miles up the glen, and the children became very, very ill. It was decided they would have to bring them down the glen to be christened. By the time the trip was organised, two or three of the children had died. The people in Lower Glenshiel did not want to be exposed to the infection and a christening stone was set up well outside the village where a minister attended to christen the children. 
It is thought that the children who had died may be buried under the ring of stones on the left. On top of the foreground knoll, a ring of stones can be seen when the bracken dies down, which are the foundations of a broch. These are the lands of Achurn, with the farmhouse ruins in the centre, along with all the substantial walls built for managing the sheep. My cousin's home, Machnagart, is seen in the distance. The ruins of two shepherds' cottages at Achurn. Today this land is no longer worked, it is just deer forest, but the sheep from Achnagart graze on it. This pile of stones is called the Glass Harn. A man who escaped justice from some crime that he had committed was supposed to have hidden in this pile of stone for years. It was also said that he went home each day for his food. The glass carn is the pile of boulders in the foreground. The fugitive claimed that he climbed to the point on the ridge above, known as Spitnalosterian, every morning to spy on what everyone else was doing. The band of rocks in the middle distance, which lie halfway between Achurn and Achnagart, are known as the Ivy Rocks. This knoll is called Croch Kufpan, where there was a well with what the old folk considered to be very good water. They would spend all day going down to Ochjorn with a horse and cart to collect a load of hay and would stop here on the way home to make tea with the water. So different from today when you could do the same job in half an hour with a tractor and trailer or a lorry. This is the map of Glenshiel from Blaw's Atlas of 1654 and we can see my cousin's farm of Achnagart, which at that time was a clachan. A major flood caused landslides at Achnagart and also at Achagerk in Glenlicht, which we also see on the map. The similarity of the two names caused a lot of problems for the rescue workers, who did not know exactly what was happening where. The Clachan of Achnashelach, or Achnashelach, on the other side of the river, is also marked in the map. This is Achnagart, my cousin's family farm. We also see the Clachan at Achnashil, the quarry, McLennan's Well, Clachachuman, and the house at Maligan. There is a deep cutting on the river at Achnagart where the farm access road crosses the river. It is thought to be a man-made cutting to drain the loch behind Maligan so that the loch bed could be used as arable ground. The raised bushy heathery growth in the foreground conceals the ruins of a cotter's dwelling at Achna Shield. In 1773, Boswell and Johnson passed through Achna Shield. Boswell wrote... We came to a rich green valley and stopped at Achnashil, a kind of rural village, a number of cottages being built together. We passed many, many miles today without seeing a house, but only little summer huts or shielings. At this Achnashil, we sat down in a green turf seat at the end of a house, and they brought us out two wooden dishes of milk. One of them was frothed like a syllabub. We had there in the circle all about us, men, women and children, all Macrae's, Lord Seaforth's people. Not one of them could speak English. I also gave each person a bit of wheat bread, which they had never tasted before. There was great diversity in the faces of the circle around us. Some were as black and wild in their appearance as any American savage. One woman was as comely as the figure of Sappho, as we see it painted. In the distance, you can see my cousin's home at Achnagart. The bushy heather growth concealing the remains of another cottage dwelling at Achnashiel. Clach Johnson, the stone that Johnson has said to have sat on at Achnashiel. My cousin's home at Achnagart nestles below its knoll on the valley floor. The first Macrae's to come to Kintail were two brothers who were sword servants to the Mackenzies, and one was given Achnagart and the other Turlaishi as a place to live. There were Macrae's there for generations. The Achnagart ones settled down and fared better than the Macrae's at Turlaishi, who remained longer as warriors. Skurna Karnach towers above the farmhouse at Achnagart.
and the saddle towers over the front of Achnegart Farm. The farm lies so deeply buried in the mountain that from November to February the sun never reaches it. The sheep pens at Achnegart were built in the early 1800s using the stone from the old cotter's dwellings in the Clachans. My cousin's husband Dolan and his uncle Johnny Ross dipping sheep at Achnegart in the 1970s. John Alec Boyd, my cousin Glenys and her son Malcolm shearing sheep at Achnegart in the early 2000s. My cousin's husband Dolan Macmillan of Achnegart. Keep your eyes peeled for this postcard. It's sold all over Scotland. This is Clacha Homan. McRae of Oar was the very strong giant of a man who it is said carried this stone on his back. While doing so, he met the mason, who said that it was the wrong shape, so he just dropped it here. McLennan's well is named after the earliest known tenants of Achnegart. As a child, Dolan remembers being sent to get a skillet of water from this well by visiting elderly relatives who believed that it had curative properties. Achnegart Quarry supplied the roadstone for the upgrading of all the roads in the area to double carriageway. The quarry ran all of the time a noisy, roaring quarry. The rock crushing plant at Achnegart Quarry. Maligan was a holding about a mile up the glen from Achnegart. It is thought that there was a loch here in the olden times, and the very deep cutting at Achnegart was dug to drain the loch so that the loch bed could be used for arable farming. Note Bonnie Prince Charlie's cave above Maligan, and the path going off the bottom edge of the map, which is the route to the fork and ridge on the saddle. The cattle drover's resting place at the Ray Hulan is also shown. This is the house at Maligan, long gone and bulldozed flat. Johnny Maligan's father was Duncan MacDonald, the Gilly Ban, and Johnny was brought up at Loch Lundy, but his mother died shortly after giving birth. Johnny then came to live at Maligan with his father and his father's sister, Marianne MacDonald. Dolan grew up with Johnny Mulligan and they were great friends. Watchers for poachers were called stoppers and because Mulligan was a favourite place for the stoppers to keep a lookout, it was known as a stop house. Mary Ann MacDonald at Mulligan. Johnny Mulligan's father, Duncan MacDonald, the Gilly Ban, in his World War I uniform. Note the spurs. The last occupant of the house at Maligan was John Hugh Maskell, who died on the 29th of January 1976. He was known as the Black Officer and had fought as a mercenary for General Franco in Spain. While on the run after the Battle of Culloden, Bonnie Prince Charlie travelled overnight from Loch Coich across the South Glen Shield Ridge and spent the day of Tuesday the 22nd of July 1746 sheltering in this cave on the north side of Glenshield behind Maligan. Come nightfall, he resumed his flight eastward to Strathcluny before moving on to Glenmoriston. From Maligan, a very good pony track goes up to the saddle, a very popular route for climbers heading to the classic climb of the Forkin Ridge. It is a busy path for most of the year. This is the view up Glenshield from that path, on the Forkin Ridge of the saddle. This is the map of the middle part of the glen. Here we see the Ray Hulan, Skura Hulan, the battle site, Lubanjorna, Altna Ferna, and the Durrock, which with 902 feet is the highest point in the pass before heading off down Strathcluny. As you go up the glen past Maligan, the hill facing you is very appropriately called Skura Hulan and the flat area below is called the Ray Hulan, which means the flat at the Coolan. The hill on the right is Fahig, and between them runs the burn called the Alt Mulligan. The drovers taking cattle from Skye swam them across the narrows at Glenelg, 
and made the steep climb over Manratigan to get here, where the cattle were rested for a few days. They then faced another steep climb up the Alt Maligan to a height of 2,600 feet over the Bialoch Dui Lake to cross the South Glen Shale Ridge before they could drop down into Glen Coich. The hill on the left here is called Lake Anaish, which joins on to Kish the Dui and has a rise of 3,035 feet with a 62% gradient and it's recognised as being one of the longest unbroken steep slopes in Scotland. The Battle of Glenshiel was the only battle of a Spanish-backed attempt to start an uprising in 1719. 300 Spanish soldiers had landed and garrisoned themselves in Elendonan Castle, where they were joined by various Scottish clans, including the Mackenzies. This army moved off east up Glenshiel, and at a narrow pass in the glen, they set up an ambush for the government troops who were heading down the glen from Inverness. The government troops had realised that there was a trap and stopped short of it. In the foreground is Telford's Bridge at Ace Nanarum, built about 1816, with a modern road bridge beyond it. The crest of the ridge beyond was the Highlanders' position on the south side of the valley. The Highlanders built stone breast walls high up in the sides of the valley to create a defensive position. In the left picture, the dip in the ridge above is known as the Pass of the Spaniards, as that is what the Highlanders used as an escape route. In the right picture, Seaforth set up his command position on a big rock in the wood behind. The government troops opened fire with mortars, first time they had been used against Highlanders, and they set the long heather on fire. The furious flames forced the Highlanders to abandon their positions, and they fled up and over the hills and melted back to their homes. The Spanish surrendered as they had nowhere to flee to, and caused a long-running political problem as Spain was not prepared to make any effort to get them home. The Royal Navy came in and tried to bombard Elendonan Castle with the ship's guns, but their efforts made absolutely no impression on the structure. So they landed and using the Spanish gunpowder stored in the castle, they blew it up from the inside. A lesson to the Mackenzies to buckle down and behave themselves. Dolan's uncle Johnny Ross and Murdo McRae, the Forestry Commission's man in charge, were cleaning a drain in the woods at the battle site when they dug up a pouch with musket balls in it, and Dolan has some of them at home. The leather bag was rotten and the stitching had gone, so they just put the musket balls in a glass jar. When Dolan was in Achnagart, he was crossing the river at Achanachchelach, where the Jacobites and Spaniards had camped, and he came across what he first thought were some bird's eggs, which, which turned out to be a pile of musket balls. A flitting taking place at the house at Aisnanarum in 1938, with Fred Walker, Donald Gillis, Jock Stewart, Ina McRae, with Betty the girl in front. The dog's name is unknown. Fred Walker was the local carter who owned the lorry. He married Dolan's Auntie Maggie, and he was the last person to live in the house at Aisnanarum before it was demolished. The house at Aisin and Aram was demolished when the new bridge was built in 1967, Telford's 1815 road bridge in the background. This is a panorama of Lupin Yorn, the barley meadow, where the ground was good for growing barley, which was used to make barley brie a primitive form of whisky. the shed at Lupin Yorn with its old and new roofs. They used to rub archangel tar and butter into the sheep's wool here to keep the maggot flies off them. It was a terrible job and you would only do ten sheep a day because it was so hard in the hands. It had to be done or you could lose half your stock to the maggots. 
When applying the tar, they sat on a stool, turned the sheep on its back and tied its legs. They then split the sheep's wool into two or three inch sections and rubbed in the tar and butter and the heat of the body melted it and it ran through the entire fleece. The shearing stools brought into the area by the border shepherds who came to contail with the sheep in the early 1800s. The moraines below Lupinorna. According to Eddie McCrae, the whisky still to make the barley brie was concealed in these moraines. The house at Craigan Lupinorna, the home of Eddie McCrae, demolished in 1967 when the new road went through the glen. About 1920, the Forestry Commission planted most of the left-hand side of the glen above the battle site. Since then, the trees have been harvested and planted again. Dolan had a newspaper cutting from the 1920s, which show a group of men digging trees out of a big bog, which had the caption, New Industry, Tree Mining in Glenshiel. What had happened was that some of the locals who had got jobs there decided the best thing they could do with the young trees was to dig a big hole in the bog and bury them. However, somebody spotted them and they had to go and dig them all up and take them out of the hole. And there were thousands and thousands of trees. The Forestry Commission's man in charge got the sack. Dolan liked the caption, Tree Mining in Glenshiel, New Industry. He thought that somebody was taking the mick. Nearly all of the men were relatives of Alec McRae who lived in Lubinjorna at the time. There was Murdo, Parker and Eddie McRae. They were all there. The Forestry Commission employed about 20 people in the glen at one time and they built a workman's hut. Dolan worked at Lubinjorna for a while in the 1960s where tree planting was still going on. Alta Perna, where the sheep banks are still visible today. The burn is a place where you can find garnets. These are ear rings made from Glenshiel garnets by Saffron Jewellery of Glenshiel. Looking down Strathcluny to Loch Cluny from the Durrock at 902 feet above sea level, the highest point on the road. A panorama of the South Glenshiel Ridge from the Durrock. These hills are all part of the Sheila estate and today there are no livestock on any of them, but at one time they carried 4,000 sheep. On the north side of the glen are several stells, which are shelters for sheep. This map shows all the settlements in the west end of Strathcluny, including the side school at the Cluny Inn. Lupa Botich, the Alt Big House, Kruachen and the Alt Moor House were all at one time either shepherds or keepers' houses. The ruins at Lupa Botich, with Cluny Inn and Loch Cluny in the distance. A film company were using the ruins as a film set and re-roofed them prior to a scene where the buildings were to be burned down. On hearing this, and not wanting to waste a good door, a man from Kyle went up and removed the barn door, which he still has on a shed in Kyle of Lachalsh today. Another story of how the buildings were burned down tells how the crofter could not get into the barn because of the hay pack behind the door. So he cut a hole in the thatch and dropped in from above. He landed into a heap of adders who were sheltering from the winter cold. The adders started stinging him, so he shouted to his wife to set the barn alight, which she did. It is not known whether he was burned alive or stung to death. Cluny Inn was originally a staging post on the through route from the Great Glen to the west coast. In the foreground, you can see the side school. Yes, the shed was a school. 
Science schools were located at places which were too remote for the children to attend the nearest public school. They may have had only a handful of pupils and might even have had an unqualified teacher. The pupils at the Clooney Side School circa 1955. Standing, Duncan MacLeod, Tommy Ross, Unknown, George Stoddart, Ronnie Ross and David Ross. Seated, Sarah MacLeod, Janet MacLeod, Betsy MacLean and the teacher and Mary Stoddart. The Side School today is now a climbing club hut. In 1953 there were only four pupils in the Side School. John and three brothers from another family. At that time, the side school was located in a bothy attached to the shepherd's house at Altmoor, and later it transferred to the parlour of the former Clooney Inn, which had closed. Eventually, it moved into this hut. For a time in the 1950s, the teacher cycled every day from near Dorney, a round trip of 40-odd miles. The Clooney Inn closed down in 1940, but the building of the Clooney Dam allowed the inn to reopen as a hotel about 1953. In 1953, the nearest telephones were 14 miles away down the Trough of Glenshiel and 12 miles south over the hills at Tom Doon by Loch Garry. Clooney Inn in winter. Clooney Inn, with the old military road to Fort Augustus, later upgraded by Telford, running in front of it. The road going up the hill behind is Telford's link road to Tom Doon. Clooney Inn in the 1960s. A tour bus at Clooney Inn in the 1960s. The hill on the left is Kishjadu. The pass in the centre is Ancoran Moor, the pass through to Glenafric, and the hill on the right is Achralig. The trees surround the Clooney Lodge. Cruachan House was situated at the head of Ancoran Moor. Here we see Clooney Lodge and Loch Clooney. Ancoran Moor, the pass through to Glenafric, is on the right. The distant snow-covered hill on the right is Skur Nangerinen, on the far side of Glenafric. An old postcard of Clooney Lodge which has been well maintained and is now a fine modern building. This is the keeper's cottage at Clooney Lodge. This picture was taken in the early 1900s and shows Mr Stoddart, the keeper, at Clooney Lodge with his wife and family, Duncan, George and Dolly. The Alt Moor House was flooded by the waters of Loch Clooney when the Hydra Dam was built. Dolan's uncle Thomas Ross and his wife Sybil and their family at the Alt Moor House in Clooney in the early 1950s. Loch Clooney before the dam was built, and as you can see, there were nine separate buildings in the area three of which were flooded by the rising waters of the dam, including Corrie Lair Lodge, which had a cluster of cottages and outbuildings around it. This is the original building at Corrie Lair Lodge. Note the shape of the front of this building, as we see it again in the next picture. The extended lodge incorporated the original building as the West Wing, Telford's Road runs out of the bottom of the picture. Note the White Keeper's Cottage behind the lodge with its two chimneys. We'll see them again shortly. Here we see the lodge with the west wing raised to two storeys. In the late 1940s, the Hydra Board bought the Corrielaer estate in preparation for the building of the Clooney Dam. This is a quote from the Evening Express on Thursday the 23rd of December 1954. The 25-room mansion house, Corrie Lair Lodge, Glen Morriston, was destroyed by fire yesterday. A busload of hydro workers from the camp at Clooney were taken to the mansion house to fight the blaze until Fort Augustus and Inverness fire brigades arrived. 
By then the fire had such a hold that nothing could be done to save the three-storey building. 28 of the executive staff of the Mitchell Construction Company, who were occupying the house while engaged on the North of Scotland Hydroelectric Board scheme, were made homeless. Arrangements had been made to accommodate them on the campsite, but all lost their belongings. The lodge, built in the 1920s, was a familiar landmark in the Glen. Circa 1956, the modern road built by the Hydro Board is a newly formed scar across the hillside above Loch Clooney. Below it we can see the remains of Corrie Lair Lodge destroyed by fire and awaiting the arrival of the floodwaters when the Clooney Dam is sealed. Note Telford's Road running up to the lodge. When the water level in Loch Clooney is low, the chimneys of the White Shepherd's Cottage behind Corrie Lair Lodge emerge out of the water. And if the water is calm, chimneys give a marvellous reflection. Looking over Loch Lundy and Loch Clooney from the 1755 Military Road, the modern road makes a distinctive sweep round the back of Loch Lundy. Prior to the building of the Clooney Dam in 1957, Loch Lundy was a separate loch lying 76 feet higher up the hillside. When there are high water levels in the dam, Loch Lundy now becomes part of Loch Clooney. The site of the Clooney Dam before the start of construction. The Clooney Dam is of rubble fill construction with a concrete panel facing and a fixed spillway in the centre. The water from this dam runs through three generating stations before it finally reaches Loch Ness. There are songs sung in Scotland of corries and bends, of rivers and mountains and beautiful glens. But the one place in Scotland that brings most appeal is a place called Kintail at the foot of Glenshiel. It lies so serene on Loch Duick's fair shores, the five sisters behind hosting climbers galore. I've travelled the highlands from Wick to Loch Hill, but my heart will always be at home in Glen Shiel. Going westwards from Cluny to the head of the Glen, past the Duloch, Lupin Yarn, and down round the bend. Where the Spaniards did battle at Dishan Arm Bridge, with the stag standing guard on the saddle's high ridge. It lies so serene on Loch Duick's fair shores, the five sisters behind hosting climbers galore. I've travelled the highlands from Wick to Loch Hill, but my heart will always be at home in Glen Shiel. Then down by the quarry where the river runs strong, there's a pool there where salmon come yearly to spawn. You're nearly at home when Loch Shiel comes on your right. When you round the church corner, Loch Duick's in sight. It lies so serene on Loch Duick's fair shores. The five sisters behind hosting climbers galore. I've travelled the highlands from Wick to Loch Hill, but my heart will always be at home in Glen Shiel. There's Kintail Lodge Hotel where you go for a dram, where the view's so majestic dining at the port van. Alta Crying Carn Gorm and Benato's High Peak which reaches in Verinet at the foot of Glen Leet. 
It lies so serene at lock to its fair shores. The five sisters behind toasting climbers galore. I've travelled the highlands from Wick to Loch Hill, but my heart will always be at home in Glenshiel.